Hello and welcome back to the FEZ show. It is the 17th of August and we are waiting again. We have 152 days until the start of season 7, which is 8 days less now for how long we waited for Formula E to restart from Marrakesh to Berlin. Amazingly, that was 160 days. So, in today's episode, we'll be recapping the final couple of races of the season, we'll have a look towards next season, and we'll discuss the latest news that is coming out of Formula E. And joining me today is Edward Hunter. Morning, Ed. How are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about those last few races in Berlin. Yeah, it was obviously... A couple, a couple of days, I think, obviously, we had, we had a sort of a break. I think we all needed a break after all the post race live shows and, and all the news stories and, and stuff that everybody was doing. It was nice to have just a weekend just to chill. And we're back on the Monday, and there's lots of stuff to talk about today. And let's start, um, Ed, with the news. Um, because as soon as, well, we'll deal with the one that happened on the line in two seconds, but I think this one's a bit more significant. Um, the day after we were talking about this, me and you actually, was how long are Porsche going to wait to sign Pascal Verlein or announce that they've signed Pascal Verlein? And it wasn't long. It was nine o'clock Central European time uh, the pr next day. And Pascal Verlein has joined Porsche. And then my question to you for that is, has the signing of Pascal Verlein made Porsche instantly better? Or do they still have a lot of work to do in order to catch up? Because I feel like from sort of the big six, the big name manufacturers in there, that they are actually, you know, maybe a step behind. Yeah, it's, worth, it's important to keep in perspective, I think, that it's still Porsche's first season. It was only Porsche's first season in Formula They didn't have a preparation year where they dipped their toe in their water with uh, one of their sort of sub-brands like Mercedes here to HWA in season five. Uh, they literally just went in cold, did a maybe... A uh, year, a couple of uh, uh, several months of testing with Niliani, interestingly, who was the one who unfortunately mm. lost his seat to Verline. And I think the reason they announced uh, Pascal just after was the truth, just out of respect to Yani. They were clearly, you could tell they were very happy that he finally got stuff together and scored some points, but sadly it wasn't quite enough for him to maintain his drive because you could tell the decision with Verline had already been made. Uh, is it instantly going to make Porsche uh, better? I don't think so. I think Verlein's definitely a very talented driver, and I think he's hopefully going to be able to push the team forward. And uh, is he going to be able to score the same amount of points as Lotter? I don't know. I think they're both pretty interesting drivers. I think Verlein definitely feels like an investment for the future, whereas Lotter is, uh, I don't want to say getting on a bit, but he's definitely on the older side. So uh, there's a sense that if Lotter decides to call it a day, then they've got Verlein. Uh, on their side to sort of take up the number one role so I think it's definitely not necessarily a huge like light year jump forward but I think it's definitely like I said an investment in the future in Verlein. I think they have made a small step forward let's say we are sort of expecting Pascal Verlein to match Andre Lotterer whereas Neil Yarny wasn't able to match Andre Lotterer. I think that's fair to say um, throughout the course of the season. So I think it has made them instantly better because I think there's more points on the table now for the team, whereas Neil Yarny, as we said, picked up his final, his first points of the season in the final two races, whereas you wouldn't expect Pascal Verlein to pick up his first couple of points in the first two races. So I think from a consistency level and looking at moving up the table next season, I think Porsche have got better. But, as I said, when you look and you, know, you make a great point that it was their first team, and we have to go back to season four when, you know, this partnership, when Neil Yarny was the first one to, to join Dragon, actually, and it, that was supposed to be their partnership uh, with Dragon to sort of get themselves ready to make an entry into Formula E. And that only lasted that one weekend and Neil Yarny left. And I don't know what the ins and outs have happened, actually, there. But... When you look at Mercedes, who obviously had that preparation year of HWA, they look strong, and we'll talk about them later. And then you've got BMW, you've got Audi. You know, there's a lot of big German manufacturers there. And I just think Porsche, yes, you're right, it's their first season. But I think they've just got a little bit to catch up because out of those big names, out of those big German manufacturers, I think they're slightly behind. But not by much, but just slightly behind. Yeah, I, I, I agree on that. I think 
the problem is I thought about this a few seasons ago when Neo hired Tom Dillman and Oliver Turvey and they think great Tom Dillman's great Oliver Turvey's great and then the car was terrible so just having a brilliant lineup doesn't guarantee that you're gonna score double the points although I think it seems unlikely Porsche and the team under Emil Lindsay who's the team principal I think at Porsche I think they're extremely capable they've won in you know other categories such as you know World Endurance Championship and LMP1 it's obviously the top category there and uh, it, it seems to me unlikely that Porsche would drop the ball next season but I suppose there's every chance even with these big name manufacturers that they could go down the wrong developmental alley and end up with powertrain that's you know too heavy or inefficient or even lacking in some way. It'll be interesting to see what Porsche does next season, I think. But let's move on to the next bit of news, which dropped on the flag, right? As literally as the final race, as Stoffel van Dorn crossed the line to win Venturi 4, this is the best time to announce that Felipe Massa is leaving the team. And I thought this was interesting, right? So going back a couple of days uh, prior, Felipe Massa said, and the story is on Formula Rezone's website, that it, Formula is not fun anymore because of these safety car rules, right? And I thought, ah, that's my, he's 39 years of age. He's saying it's not as fun as it used to be because of these new type of rules. Saying that the driver is more like an engineer rather than a driver and he's not really driving the car as he could do in previous, uh, in season five, effectively. And I thought, ha, ah, is this the first sign, Ed, that Felipe Massa is going to leave and obviously it turned out that it did but i thought that moment was critical possibly it could be that he kind of made up his mind during the break and what happened in berlin sort of confirmed that uh with uh he only scored three points all season whereas in season five he was on the podium in monaco and he scored i think 39 points in total he was something like 14 for 15th and yeah it was a pretty abysmal season especially when you see motara in the other car in the other venture he was able to score points a bit more consistently although I think it's fair to say in Berlin they just had a really tough time and Susie Wolf didn't seem to know what the problem was and especially when you saw the factory Mercedes team doing well it, it's a little bit disheartening for Venturi but yeah it definitely seems like uh, Felipe didn't necessarily fall out with the team he just fell out with uh, out of love with the sport unfortunately so his little his two season love affair seems to be uh, over I wonder, do you think it's going to be, is that bad, bad for Formula E in the sense that Felipe has like obviously you know, a huge fan base from Formula 1 or do you think it's, because uh, I think Pico was saying this on the stream after, literally after that final race that, you know, you know that it's sort of, everyone was always accusing Formula of being an F1 driver retirement home and now with guys like Massa, Heidfeld, etc, etc, all sort of being, you know, making their way out of the sport gradually, that it's sort of becoming a bit less like that. What do you think, Jack? I think we have to look at the World Endurance Championship, right? A lot of drivers that were in F1 drop into the World Endurance Championship and a lot of drivers that didn't make into F1 drop into the World Endurance Championship. And F1 is the pinnacle of motorsport. We all know that. But, you know, I think it's fine if an ex-F1 driver, I think it's good for Formula E if an ex-F1 driver pops into Formula 1, especially like Stoffel van Dorn, for example. Stoffel van Dorn has huge amount of publicity, huge amount of fans, always winning the fan boost. So that brings fans over to watch Doppel Van Dorn, right? So straight away, win, 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 chicken dinner, right? Because you've got fans coming across from one series to watch this series and, and hopefully become a Formula E fan because they're watching drivers. So I think having drivers that have those big names who have been in Formula 1 wasn't bad for a marketability side for Formula E because it, it brings eyes across. It brings eyes across and, you know, some people might go, nah, okay, I like Stoffel Van Dorn or I like Sebastian Buemi or I like Brendan Hartley, but it's not for me, right? I don't really like Electra. And that's fine. That's totally fine. But there might be some people who go, oh, I really like Stoffel Van Dorn and I really like Felipe Massa and, oh, Formula E is really interesting. Oh my God, the racing is fantastic and you get fans that way. So I think, you know, it gives eyeballs on Formula E, so I think in that sense, from a marketability side, um, it's a plus, I think. Although I did joke about uh, Massa leaving, that if it's anything like uh, his Formula One uh, <laughs> departure, that 
he'll have this big emotional departure and then he'll be back next season before finally leaving for good, which is what he did at Williams when there's a chain reaction after Nico Rosberg left and Bottas filled the seat and Williams suddenly needed another driver and Massa was available. But yeah, so I, I can't see that happening again at Venturi. It's interesting to think, I guess, who's going to replace him now. There are a couple of interesting names that are swirling around. You said that you thought in the stream you thought that Jamie Chadwick might be an option and I thought that was really interesting. Well, I think she's now... Uh, we spoke to Susie Wolf about this, and this is like a little snippet preview about what's going to come um, in the magazine, because we feature Susie Wolf in the magazine. Um, and she's she's keeping an eye on Jamie Chadwick, and she thinks, obviously, a lot of other people are. But, she, you know, she made the point that everyone has to earn the right to be a Formula E driver. You can't just be a Formula E driver because you're doing like well in other series like it needs to be consistent she needs to be doing well now in her new championship yes she's done a w series but she said she's a driver that you're definitely keeping an eye on and she thinks multiple teams are with the likes of neo and jaguar because that's who she they tested for so i think you know jamie chadwick you know is on the cards and i have a feeling that she is now sort of associated with the Venturi team because as I said when we were doing those interviews and and the Venturi PR officer got back to us she said if you need any more news on Jamie, Ed or Felipe please let me know um and well I was like who's Jamie and then as I said oh it must be Jamie Chadwick there's the only there's only one Jamie I can think of who's a racing driver um who has that name and obviously with the link with Susie Wolf. And, and the Dare to be Different program and uh, Women in Motorsport. Green, I guess, but he's It could unlikely. be Jamie Green, but I think he's Audi more, Audi related, yeah. uh, rather than uh, being in a Mercedes powertrain car. And Ed but, is obviously either Eduardo Mortara, not Edward Hunter. <laughs> yes, of course, of course, yes. Um, although it would be quite funny if Venturi said, if you need more news on Ed. Um, My lips are sealed. Yes. <laughs> um, but no, for me, Ed. I, I thought it was obvious there's the main candidate from this drive is Nelson PK Jr. Because I think Venturi is quite a luxurious seat going into next season because of that Mercedes powertrain. And we know that that Mercedes powertrain is, you know, half decent. And you'd expect Mercedes to make another step forward. And with Venturi having that Mercedes powertrain, and if you're Nelson PK Jr., who somehow just turns up for the final two races to do a bit of commentary um and almost all of a sudden there's potentially free seats to get his teeth suck into and start talking to team principals and start making his way and we have to remember we talked about it when um nelson pk jr did his interview with inside electric that you know he wants a return into formula e. and i think if there was a drive that looks quite promising you got a good teammate in eduardo mortara you've got a mercedes powertrain You've got a wealth of experience of how to drive a Formula E car. I think Venturi could be... And I think we've seen it this season. Like, they're scoring back-end points. I think Nelson PK Jr., if there was a drive that I wanted in Formula E, I think Venturi is a good one. Yeah, and uh, I, I I agree that Nelson's uh, comment, quote-unquote commentary was uh, somewhat lackluster. That he's, He didn't sound as excited in the race as perhaps he could be, could have been. But... Uh, I, I guess it, I know it's hard to really say because to me he didn't sound like a driver that was on the verge of getting a Formula E seat so perhaps he was keeping his cards quite close to his chest on that one uh, Venturi definitely looks like a better seat than say Dragon or Neo or you're pretty much guaranteed to be at the back so um, I, I think it'd be great to see Nelson back uh, would he fit in at Venturi it'd be interesting to see Masses definitely seemed to fit in pretty well so I guess uh, I guess Nelson might have a decent chance too but uh, I wonder if the way that Nelson left Formula E at Jaguar with a bunch of incidents and crashes I wonder if that might count against him whether maybe Venturi might be more likely to go for a younger driver for the seat I think the one that the name that I heard thrown around was Norman Nato who used to be in Formula 2 and French driver who tests for the team and uh, there are a couple other names like we said uh, that were rolling around yeah Jake Hughes was the other one but let me just I want to recap on PK because I still think PK for me is is the favorite is the top runner at this precise moment um simply because like he, we all know like I know from interviewing PK we all know PK from interviews he's a chill guy he's a chill guy right he's not someone who gets 
you know, overly excited. He's not like me, for example, right, where I can go into a passionate big rant, talk really loudly, really enthusiastically about something, right, which might be great, which we see Dario and Jack do on commentary, right? Um, and, and, you know, that works well for commentary. But what we see with Nelson PK is, is he's chill, right? And I don't understand, like, honestly, if you're Formula E, I think Nelson PK Jr. was really good as, you know, like, the side-by-side -side presenter giving information about what was yeah, going he was on a good pundit, and especially yeah. when all you had to do was mention Degrassi, and he would suddenly perk up and talk about, well, you know, it's not surprising to see Lucas lose his cool, you know, <laughs> and he would like throw shade at him, which was hilarious. Yeah, it was fun, and 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 it was great to see actually because obviously we know how strong that rivalry is between those two. But I think it was great as a pundit, right? But they wanted him to do commentary, and if you were Formula E, and you know. Um, if you're Formula E and you're thinking, who do I need as someone who might be a bit inspiring, who knows a lot about Formula E and could actually hold themselves in front of a microphone and be quite decent? Nelson Piquet Jr. is not number one on that list. He's not. So I have a feeling, right, Nelson's... I think Formula E have obviously contacted Nelson, but Nelson has said, look, there is an opportunity that I could speak to teams. And then they're like, well, we also need you to do some commentary. So would you mind doing some commentary and some punditry while you go? Oh, if I teams? have to. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, then, if that's part of the plan that you want me to be in. So that, I honestly, and I know we're, we're probably going quite long on this, but why would Pete Nelson PK Jr. travel all the way from either Monaco or Brazil, wherever he was staying, right? to come and do a Formula E commentary and not get anything out of it. That's not how Nelson PK operates. That is not how he operates. So I 100% I believe, and there's other teams that he could have spoken to as well. Um, and we'll probably get onto that uh, quite soon. But yeah, obviously, and the only other name to just wrap up this part of the program, um, Ed, was Jake Hughes, because as I said, I didn't realize he was 26 years of age racing in F3. Um, obviously part of the HWA brand, not doing too badly in F3, I think he, because of that Mercedes link as well with HWA, um, that could be a potential another driver that could become a Formula E driver. Yeah, he won the uh, feature F3 race at Barcelona, not just the other weekend. So he's definitely a very talented driver, JQ, who's, um, you know, not quite got himself into Formula 2 yet. I believe he just doesn't quite have a big enough budget, but he's always, he's, he's sort of put together giant killing drives for HWA and F3 because... The top teams, obviously, in F3 are Prima, who pretty much ex exclusively dominate the uh, top three positions there. So whenever Jake Hughes can get up there and win races, it's always pretty impressive. Uh, but it, yeah, I, I could definitely see him, him using those Mercedes links to at least get, get in contact with uh, Susie Wolf. I, 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 for a lot of these drivers, it really just depends whether the motivation to commit to Formula E is there, because I don't think... Um, just oh, just do a season in Formula E and use it as a springboard to go somewhere else. I I don't think that's really the intention. I think if Venturi hire someone, it will probably be for the long haul, which is why I think they're more likely to go for a younger driver, maybe who's a bit more hungry and can commit for a bit longer. Whereas with Nelson, I imagine he might get maybe two or three seasons out of him at the most before he decides to uh, either if it's not competitive, call it a day or move on and you know fully retire maybe. I don't know, but so I, I'm a little bit dis in disagreement that Nelson is the favourite. I definitely think he's in contention, though. Yeah, I, I understand. I just think he's favourite because why on earth is he there? And he's got first opportunity to talk to said team principals about the drives. And obviously, there's there's other drives out there which will which we'll get onto. But let's move on. Let's move on to Mercedes. Talking about Mercedes and the Mercedes powertrain. Let's walk onto the works team because. You know, they got the 1-2 in Sunday's race. And I think qualifying, which we'll get onto very quickly, um, played a huge role in this. But I think, you know, let's uh, qualifying on Saturday or for the final race, second to final race, we saw, you know, the Costa Verne, Buemi. They didn't set a lap time. And Mercedes had the opportunity, right, to set a lap time and get up the grid. But both drivers, Nick De Vries hit the wolf, Soffel Van Dorn went wide. And they both started down the order as well. But then on Sunday, you know, something similar to Group 1 was just atrocious. Um, and this time they managed to get both cars in the Super Bowl. Uh, qualified well, Van Dorn being on pole. Nick DeFries, I think, was fourth. And then they managed to finish that race 1-2. So I, I'm like, yes, 
you did great on Sunday, but could they have potentially had a double win on Saturday and Sunday? Because obviously Oliver Rowland won on Saturday, but he didn't really have much competition. It was only really Robin Frines that was his competition, and you'd feel like Mercedes could be challenging Nissan if they were up there. Um, but because of that poor qualifying, I think they, you know, they didn't. Um, so I'm thinking, did they miss out on opportunity, Mercedes, to probably win both races? I'm not sure. I didn't think Mercedes's pace in the in Saturday's race was all that great, even considering, you know, starting low down the grid and you know having to be held up by other cars. Uh, I, I actually thought Tachita were much faster in that Saturday race, but unfortunately, they both uh, Vern got penalty and De Costa sort of had a basically a ran out of power right at the end. I had some kind of battery system fault and uh, you know basically had to retire on the last or second to last lap. Um, but yeah, Mercedes was definitely really impressive on Sunday. Once it's a little bit like Mercedes in other categories we've seen. Once they lock out the, once they get up the front, they're pretty hard to catch. And uh, uh, I, I think also worth pointing out, Nissan did a very good job in both of those last two races as well, with Buemi and uh, Roland on on Saturday. And Roland, of course, taking his first win, which was a huge milestone for him. I've always always liked Oliver Rowley. You know, Oliver Roland is a Yorkshireman from Barnsley always liked because uh, my dad's from Yorkshire so there's a little bit of personal connection there he was quite happy when I told him he'd won afterwards but um, but yeah um, Mercedes really impressive uh, I think you were saying that you thought Nick De Vries was uh, more impressive even though Van Dorn won which I thought was kind of interesting because I actually feel like Van Dorn did a better job over the whole Berlin uh, um, six races in nine days so the whole thing that's interesting that you think Van... I think Nick De Vries did much better than Van Dorn. I know Van Dorn did win the race, but I think you I think De Vries was from... better in qualifying overall. I think I you Van Dorn expect... had better races. I think Van Dorn came through the field, but, you know, Nick De Vries was up there. And when Nick De Vries was up there, I think Saturday's race, he was fighting. He was in fifth place. He was fighting the likes of those behind. And he was in that that gaggle, really. Um, and he, he was there in other races as well, fighting for podiums, finishing in P5. I think Nick De Vries was more consistent than Stoffel Van Dorn over the course of the six days. Yes, Stoffel Van Dorn won, and I think Stoffel Van Dorn probably does have the minor edge in that team, um, in pace. But I think Nick De Vries, you know, really stood out, really stood out to be as consistent, you know, made more Super Bowls than um, Stoffel Van Dorn did, and, and was constantly, you know, in the top end of that field. So I think, you know, it was kind of disappointing. Hence why I think, you know, they should have probably won the Saturday race. But I do agree with you. Um, Nissan and Mercedes, are, do you think they're the ones at the moment fighting for best of the rest? Because you've got Tech Cheetah that are up there, you know, a couple of attempts ahead, I would say. And then would you say the next two best teams are Nissan and Mercedes? Uh, from what we saw in Berlin, it's hard to sort of disagree with that. But... Um... I definitely think there were some teams that really underperformed in Berlin, such as BMW Andretti and Jaguar both stand out to mind. BMW Andretti jumped from down from second down to fifth, I think, by the end of it in the team's championship. And uh, they just had uh, Gunther, who won a race uh, on the, was it the Wednesday? The third race, yeah. Uh, but then they, um, I think... Uh, Elsewhere, Gunther was getting involved in incidents, basically, from what I recall. And then you had Alexander Sims, who was a bit more consistent, but not quite as quick, and sort of struggled to really score you know, a handful of points here and there. So that was really what the, what caused BMW Grand Jury's downfall. And then we had Jaguar, who just really um, really just didn't, didn't seem to g mesh with any of the combinations of circuits that we used. And uh, Mitch Evans did his best score points where he could, but obviously... James Collado and then Tom Bonquist just couldn't score any points at all. So, yeah, that was that was what did for Jaguar in, in that instance. So I actually think we we didn't see the best of either of those teams. But yeah, Nissan and Mercedes really got it together at the end when it counted and took some milestone victories and their their, their first and only wins of the season, I believe. So uh, yeah, you definitely think they've got the momentum behind them, but that doesn't mean that Andretti, BMW, and uh, Jaguar can't catch up. Let's talk qualifying, because I think qualifying, in terms of, you know, Formula E and what we were expecting in Berlin, we were expecting Group 1 to have less of an impact in terms of the track was incredibly more rubbered in, therefore they should be able to make it into Super Bowl far more easily. And that was the complete opposite, because 
you know, let's go to the final two races. Yes, they didn't. On Saturday, they massively wanted to be last, and they didn't make the line, which was just an absolute joke um, from the teams trying to fight to be last. And then on Sunday, okay, they managed to all cross the line, but the highest Gunther Group 1 uh, started was 18th, with Maximilian Gunther, and the rest were behind. And we saw that the track was so rubbered in. It was unbelievably rubbered in. Apart from obviously the new section, but the turn one, all the new, everything was basically rubbered in. So I can't believe how qualifying caught the teams out. And and why do you think qualifying, even in group one, you know, caught these teams out? And why was it so much slower when we were expecting it to be pretty much identical across the whole group stage? Well, I think having those extra six or eight, that whole extra section, I think, that hadn't been used all week, I think maybe uh, having those uh, slower speed corners where it's much more sort of technical, I think that may have, um, because when you're cause when you're going through there, you see, like, I was remember watching slow-mos of Robin Frines bouncing over the curbs and stuff like that. It's, where, it's a corners where you have to be really aggressive to kind of get through, and I wonder if that just means that you know, you get lots of marbles being thrown up there. You can't really go offline. I remember won the race. I think it was Saturday where Degrassi basically got caught out, went straight into I think the back of Gunther, which is one of the races where I think Gunther had to retire from. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's it's a very sort of diff- easy section to get wrong. Let's put it that way. As for the the whole incident with the um, it was I think the way me both the cheaters and uh, Degrassi they all just held each other up and didn't make the line. I remember Mark Preston was talking about this afterwards and says, look, you know, we were just trying to make sure we were one of the last ones across the line, which we've done early, we've done before in the season and we've got on pole and we've looked really smart and here we just sort of got it wrong. And it's just one of those things where we thought it was a risk that was worth taking because we'd already won the championships. And so I can definitely see it from that point. Degrassi was not happy about it at all and uh, PK certainly didn't miss an opportunity to rib him about it. But, um, but yeah, I um, I can sort of understand. I, I was inter- I didn't hear Buemi complain about it at all. Buemi was sort of, uh, if he did complain, it, it didn't get picked up by anybody. But um, but yeah, it was, it, it really just um, allowed the lady groups to dominate the grid and basically meant that Roland didn't have anyone behind who could really, apart from, I guess, um, uh, who was behind Robin Frines? Robin Frines. Frines, wasn't it? Yeah, Frines, and there was then there was the battle between Rast and uh, Lotterer, which was quite entertaining. But um, but yeah, I think um, I, I think uh, the I think they definitely blew a chance to to at least get on the podium, if not uh, do really well. The Cheetahs and possibly the Grassy Boy me as well. And it was all just because they were all trying to do the same thing. They're all on the same piece of track, and it all ended in kind of uh, acrimony and complaining. It did indeed. Uh, I was just, I just was shocked. I, when you looked at the track and you were like, they all moan that it's not rubbered in and that it's kind of green. These weren't green tracks. These were really rubbered in tracks, especially some of the sections. You'd think that a car like the Tech Cheaters, the BMWs, yes, they may be. Weren't they washing section. away rubber in between the pairs they of did, races? They did, but when you look at the track, there was still a lot of rubber down, right? They did wash the track between race one, well, after the first weekend, going into the second sort of. So after Wednesday, Thursday, race one and two, they did wash the track Friday. Full Saturday. I don't know if they washed the track. It didn't look like they'd washed the track, to be honest with you. It might have just um, been because for... it was they did it in reverse, so the rubber would have been in all the wrong places, mainly. Like different Maybe. lines. Maybe. But I, it, it, the track just looked so grippy. Um, and obviously the lap times were getting quicker and quicker as each day went on. Um, so it was just... It was kind of a shock. So let's move on then to next... Look, look ahead to next season. Um, because, as we say, I think we say this every year, Ed, that... Formula E is probably going to be one of the most competitive years ever. And we probably do say that every year. But with Tech Cheetah obviously having that gap. And with the likes of Mercedes, Audi, BMW, Nissan, possibly Porsche. Put them in that battle as well. Jaguar as well. You're expecting at least one of those teams to bridge the gap to Tech Cheetah. Um, So Tech Cheetah aren't as dominant as they've been for the last sort of three seasons. Um, And try and maybe catch up. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of we thought we were speculating about you know, a couple of teams that we thought might be up there. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's always the case that we always... I think because in comparison to certain other championships, sometimes Formula E does seem, by comparison, much more competitive. There's a sense of, 
oh, any team could win this race, or almost any team. We have got a little bit, I think, of a almost kind of two-tier system where we've got Neo and Dragon fighting at the back and then all the other teams fighting a bit further up, I think. Generally, there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, I, I don't know. I think one team that we haven't talked too much about in this episode, at least, is uh, Envision Virgin, who have got the Audi powertrain. I definitely think if the, uh, the Audi wasn't necessarily the one to have, but um, Envision Virgin definitely got the most out of it this season. We saw, we're talking about Frines getting a couple of second places, uh, I think they were a little bit unlucky not to win in any of the Berlin races, but Sam Bird did win earlier in the season in Saudi Arabia. And of course, they haven't got Sam Bird anymore. They've got Nick Cassidy, who's you know still pretty capable. But I think that's a good driver lineup. I think I think if anyone can, um, who's, you know, obviously just Cheetah were a customer team and then joined up with DS. But I think if anyone is, who's a customer team at the moment that can challenge, it's probably Envision Virgin Racing. Let's talk a few potential driver moves. Let's talk. Let's throw a hat in the ring here. And where I want to throw my hat in the ring here for you, because I think this will interest you massively, is I think we've seen the last of Alexander Sims. Part of me hopes we haven't. But I think, honestly, with his performances in Berlin and the chances he had from Group 2 to capitalise on, you know, the poor Group 1 qualifying sessions, he just didn't do it. He just did not do it. And I'm thinking, if I'm BMW, and there's always a question mark hanging over Sim's head, rightly or wrongly, however you feel about it, for me, probably wrongly. But I think we've obviously seen the last Alexander Sims race, and I'm thinking, well, who could replace Alexander Sims, who's on the current Formula E grid? I know people would say, well, they'd just look at their BMW drive uh, program and go for maybe Lucas Auer or Aya, who was um, at the track. Uh, but I honestly think I wouldn't do that. I'd have a look at a certain Oliver Turvey, who's in that Neo car, I'm thinking who could actually come into this team and start challenging for wins with Gunther straight away. And there's only one man that comes to my mind who would be available, and that would be Oliver Turvey. What do you think on that? Yeah, I guess they might, I guess someone like Daniel Act might also be available too, but Turvey seems like yeah, I definitely think Turvey might be the more attractive candidate, given that he generally beat Daniel Act in a lot of those uh, Berlin races, even in the horrible Neo that was he kept getting uh, hit by the cars and he had to sort of, like continue a huge damage. But um, but yeah, I um, I don't know. I feel a bit sad uh, for Alexander Sims because he started the season so strongly, and um, we really saw almost the best and also kind of the worst of it. I think is qualifying after Saudi Arabia wasn't terribly consistent and often he would end up having to do a lot of recovery drives. Uh, I think it does, I think what doesn't help is that Gunther won one of the races, even though he's very inconsistent, won one of the races, where Sims never really looked like um, getting on the podium, barely he was able to score uh, points. So that's definitely not, not a great look for him, but I, I don't know, I, f I feel like it's really hard to judge drivers ju just purely based on what happened in Berlin because it's the sort of thing where if you get into, uh, we saw this to an extent with kind of James Collado as well, he's out of the series and committed to World Endurance now, but he just got into this sort of, a lot, sort of some bad luck and there would, he got into the, these sort of negative spirals where he's having to take penalties constantly and it just, obviously James Collado, a man on the way out, but I was on the Sims with still a point to prove, I think, and uh, trying to, you know, was in championship contention going into the whole thing so i i definitely personally think turvey more experienced um bit of a bit more of a consistent performer especially in qualifying uh because I, I can see why he would be attractive there but on the other hand i think alexander sims is popular in the team he's a big electric vehicle advocate his technical feedback's just as good as oliver turvey's uh, so i i think from bmw's point of view there may not be that much of a if if Oliver if Oliver Turvey's not that much quicker than Sims, there might not be a huge motivation to switch. But if they're feeling adventurous, they may do it. The thing is for me, right, before we wrap up the show, I think it depends on what Neo do next season. And if Neo decide to stick with a powertrain that's really slow, say a season six Dragon powertrain or a season six Mercedes powertrain, um, that's not gonna stead Oliver Turvey in you know, he's not. That's not. I don't think that's going to motivate him because it's going to be another season at the back. Because I even think a season six powertrain, even if you put a season six DS powertrain, I reckon in that field um, next season, they'll probably still be towards the back because everyone makes a step forward. 
No, not from next season. Not from next season. They can all make a new season, a new powertrain for next season. But then it is frozen for two years. So there, a lot of people are expecting. I think pretty much everyone that we've spoken to says they're making a new powertrain for season seven, and then they will continue that through into season eight. Well, the customer teams are buying all, from you know the current. So you'd expect the, teams, the yeah. customer teams to buy next season's powertrain. So if Neo. Because I'm saying this because if all of us, let's say, Neo buy a DS or a BMW or a Mercedes powertrain or a Nissan even, he might be tempted to stay because that might push Neo further forward, right? And that might give him a chance to fight for some points, especially if they buy a DS powertrain, I would say. Um, but if they don't, if they buy another Dragon powertrain or if they buy a Season 6 powertrain, I think... Then Oliver Turvey moves, but if they if he signs if they sign a DS powertrain for example for season seven, and I'd assume that would be a good powertrain, then I have a feeling Oliver Turvey could stay at Neo. Hmm. Well, would they buy DS? Because obviously, to cheat are owned by Chinese media capital, obviously own own a stake in the series as well. Whereas Neo are owned by Free 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 Racing and. It might be a bit weird if you're trying to have this all Chinese team. That, oh, we're buying a powertrain that the other Chinese team uses much more successfully to win championships. I have a feeling they might go for a different option. But um, but yeah, I, I think Turby would probably rather succeed with Neo uh, free 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 because he's been there so long. He knows all the staff there, and I think he, he in his interview we do we always talked you know put importance of look you know. Um, even if if I do badly, I'm not upset for myself. I'm upset for you know the team because I don't like throwing away having those opportunities thrown away. And uh, equally, when he does well, it's like the team is the first one he go, he credits. So I think it, it would take a while for him to bed in certainly at BMW and really compared to to Neo. And the, I think the power choice is important. I don't think it's the only factor. I think having a good working relationship with the staff is also going to be uh, pretty decisive as well. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see what Turvey does, but we are rapidly running out of time, Ed. I want to say a massive thank you for being on. Oh, uh, no worries. It's always a pleasure. Um, and thank you so much for watching. So we will be back because there's lots to talk about, so we're not going to go disappear. There's plenty of stuff coming from Formula Rezone in terms of FEZ shows, Twitch stuff, YouTube. There's going to be plenty coming, so there's not going to be a moment lost over these next 152 days in terms of the season but thank you so much for watching uh please remember to hit the like and subscribe button that helps us out massively we have a discord channel if you want to come talk to us in discord you know find out the latest news and what's going on in formula e hit the discord link below if you love us that much you could also hit the patreon link um and you can maybe donate a dollar of your money uh and that helps us out bringing you better content for season seven um but thank you so much for watching um if you want to see more of us i think twitch is probably the best place to be in the evenings um we've been playing f1 2020 as mahindra racing lots of motorsport manager and there's some new stuff coming soon that i'm very excited about um to play with you guys um but thank you so much for watching we will be back very soon goodbye